Welcome to Living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Hello again, I'm Pastor Kathleen Casper, and this is Living Word. Living Word is a teaching program, and we seek through this program to be drawn closer and closer to our God through His Living Word. Our God's Word, the Bible, is a living Word. And so it is able to draw us into that relationship with our God that He wants to have with each and every one of us. We are currently working our way through the Gospel of Matthew. And so let's begin now with a word of prayer. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is indeed a beautiful day that you have made, and we rejoice, and we are glad in it. Heavenly Father, as we uh, now search your word, get into your word, and study the Gospel of Matthew, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would teach us those things that you would have us learn, that we would take away and would be able to use in our lives on a daily basis. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, yesterday, we heard in the parable of the wheat and the weeds that the sons of the kingdom and the sons of the evil one are growing up and maturing together in the earth. Years ago, I heard a description of the wheat and the weeds that has stayed with me. The particular plants being spoken of in this text, they look pretty much the same until the time of the harvest. Now, what made the difference between these two particular plants is this amazing detail. As the harvest neared, the wheat would bow underneath the, the weight of the heads of grain that had formed. They bowed. Listen to that. They bowed under the weight of the heads of grain that had formed. The weed seeds, on the other hand, remained upright. They did not bow down in a manner of speaking as the harvest approached. This truly has great significance as we think about the main difference between the children of light and the children of darkness. Those who belong to God bow down before him in humbleness of heart, whereas those who belong to the evil one have no intention whatsoever of bowing before the Lord of all the earth. They defiantly and proudly stand upright. Unfortunately, their refusal to bow before the Lord will end up in their destruction. When God's angels come to bring in the harvest at the end of the age, these uh, who will have refused to bow before God will be gathered together and thrown into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The sons of the kingdom, however, who will have humbled themselves and bowed before the Lord, they will be gathered together in God's house where, as Jesus said, they will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. As the maturing of both the sons of the kingdom and the sons of the evil one continues in the earth, we need not fear the days that are coming upon the earth. Our wonderful and amazing and loving God is in control. His plans and purposes will prevail. The outcome is already known. The evil foe has already been vanquished. The Lord Jesus Christ is the victor. The parables we heard yesterday were given to us by Jesus so that we can know already now what the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour. Both grew far beyond their original size. Someday, the kingdom of heaven will fill the earth, for that is God's plan. This actually was God's plan from the beginning of creation. When God created the man and the woman in his image and according to his likeness, he directed them to fill the earth and subdue it. According to God's design, as the man and the woman reproduced and multiplied and spread throughout the earth, so also would the kingdom of God spread throughout the earth. But when our first parents sinned, the devil took authority of the earth and everything in it. God's beautiful plans and purposes for us and for the earth were put on hold until God sent the second Adam into the world to accomplish what no offspring of the first Adam could accomplish. 
Having accomplished his assignment to reconcile the world to his father, Jesus began to reseed the earth with the kingdom of heaven. Each person who believes in Jesus is a new seed in the kingdom, a new seed which is to grow and bear fruit, the fruit of the kingdom of heaven in the earth. Are we bearing the fruit of the kingdom, or does the fruit of our lives bear more of a resemblance to the rebellious ways of our first parents? Jesus did accomplish all the Heavenly Father had for him to do while he lived on earth. After his ascension into heaven, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon all flesh, and the kingdom of heaven has been growing and growing throughout the earth since that time. The sons of the kingdom are already spread out throughout much of the earth, but there remains much room for us to be growing as mature sons of the kingdom, so that the kingdom itself is made manifest throughout the earth. St. Paul directs us to judge ourselves so we won't come under judgment. We have even been given a mirror, so to speak, in which we can look and ought to look to see if we are living according to the sinful nature or according to the Spirit of God. The mirror I'm referring to is found in Galatians 5, where we begin reading in verse 19, and here we, is what we read. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have, have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Let's keep in step with the Spirit with our eyes focused on Jesus and our hearts set on doing the will of God as faithful ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven all the days of our lives. We heard yesterday that the kingdom of heaven is also like a treasure hidden in a field and like a pearl of great value. It is of such priceless worth that it is worth selling all one has in order to obtain it. Though this is indeed so, the kingdom of heaven cannot be purchased with anything we have. Money doesn't buy it. We enter it through faith in Jesus, who through the shedding of his own blood purchased men for God from every tribe and language, people and nation. The Lord Jesus accomplished this so that we who believe in him could be a kingdom and priest to serve the one true living God and so that we will reign on the earth. Wow! We also heard that the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. We heard that when the net was full or is full and is pulled ashore, there will be a separation between the good fish and the bad. Just because someone might be caught in the net of God's kingdom is no indication that that person will be regarded as good and collected into the Lord's baskets. The Lord knows who belong to him and who do not. This being said, I must also say that Jesus came to redeem all people and re reconcile all of us to God. It may be that there are some who are listening today who will be gathered together in God's net, yet thrown away because they would have refused to be gathered into God's household by faith in Jesus. It is not too late to turn to God and grab hold of the life preserver whom God has thrown out to you to save you. Jesus is that life preserver that you have been thrown or are being thrown Grab onto him by faith. Do not think to yourself, I can save myself. You cannot. But what you cannot do, God has made possible for you and available to you. Believe in the Son of God and you will be saved. If you do not believe, you stand condemned already because you will not have believed on the one God sent into the world. These descriptions of the kingdom of heaven are truly helpful to us. They are new treasures which God brought out of his storeroom to show us and share with us. And just think about it. The treasures God has to show us and share with us throughout eternity will be endless because God is our endless, boundless, eternal God. Won't eternity be fun? 
when our time together came to an end yesterday, I read quickly through the closing verses of Matthew 13. So let's hear them again. When Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue. And they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown and in his own house is a prophet without honor. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Now people have wondered, often wondered in fact, what kind of childhood Jesus must have had. From these few verses we can easily conclude that there didn't appear to be much in his life to catch the eyes of his town folk. His growing up apparently had no indications that he was nothing but an ordinary child. Jesus' ordinariness as a child seems to be the reason given here why the people in his hometown couldn't or wouldn't accept him. Too bad. Their offense at him and their lack of faith prevented Jesus from doing many miracles there. Now we have already had the opportunity to consider the healing ministry of Jesus and the role faith has in healing. We have learned that sometimes the person who was healed is highlighted because the person did have faith to be healed. We had read about a woman who had been, been bleeding for 12 years and the two men that were blind, uh, they were healed because they had faith. And we are told that they had faith to be healed. Now sometimes the faith wasn't present in the person being healed at all. The centurion's servant, we have no indication if he had had any faith to be healed. And we know good and well that the dead girl that Jesus raised would not have had faith to be healed. Now sometimes the faith was found in the person making the request for another person. Like the centurion for his servant. Or like the men who carried the paralytic to Jesus. Or the parents who had made the request that their daughter be raised from the dead. Well, and sometimes we as we have already read, there doesn't appear to be faith mentioned at all. But healing was accomplished anyway. On these occasions, the faith was not manifest in the one needing healing or those who had requested it, but there was healing anyway. We see this in operation when Jesus goes to Peter's house and finds his mother-in-law sick with a fever. We don't have any indication that Peter or Peter's mother-in-law asked for her healing. But when Jesus saw she was sick, he touched her, and she was healed. From these particular instances, we learned a number of things. First, we saw that it is God's nature. We see that it is God's nature. It is his desire to heal. Healings are a reality of the kingdom of heaven being made manifest in the earth. Second, faith is important in healing, but we have got to understand that it isn't always necessary for the person who needs the healing to have faith. As we've already read, the faith necessary for healing is sometimes found in those requesting the healing. And third, sometimes God simply manifests his goodness by healing people. Now we can add an additional observance. Lack of faith can hinder healing. In the case in Jesus' hometown, the townspeople took offense at Jesus, and their offense kept him from giving to them or pouring out upon him the things that God would have liked to have given them. Now we may ask why their lack of faith hindered Jesus' ministry among them, when at other times and with other healings nothing was mentioned about faith having to be, a, be present at all. It was the offense people took with Jesus which prevented them from believing in him. God will not overrule our wills. He is not a tyrant, he's not a bully, he's not a dictator. He will not force the many good gifts that he has to give upon us. One has to wonder about the gifts God may have wanted to give us, but we have not received. For all we know, each and every one of us has a room full of unopened gifts in heaven, all because we would not receive them from our God's hands. I hope not, but that is possible. We've come to Matthew 14, and the and the first 11 verses give us the report of how John the Baptist came to be beheaded. 
verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus, and he said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now, Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered him a prophet. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for them and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. John the Baptist was beheaded because Herod made a reckless oath. Life and death are in the power of the tongue, and this became literally so in Herod's case. John the Baptist had only done what the Lord had called him to do. He was called to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Herod needed to repent of the sin he had committed when he took his brother Philip's wife to be his own wife. This was unlawful behavior. He could have repented of it, but he chose not to repent instead. He wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people. His wife Herodias didn't have such qualms about the people, nor did she fear the Lord or honor his commands. When the king did not bridle his tongue, she took that occasion to force his hand and have John beheaded. Because life and death are in the power of the tongue, a very good Bible verse to memorize and recite often to ourselves is this one from Psalm 141, verse 3. David praying to the, to, David praying to the Lord said, Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Yes, Lord, please do this. Verse 13. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. What moves Jesus to heal the sick? Compassion. That's what it is. Compassion. Now we have heard this before in Matthew 9. There we read, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Immediately after we read these words of Matthew 9, Jesus instructed his disciples to pray to the Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers into his harvest field. After instructing them to pray and ask for more laborers, Jesus sent his own disciples into the harvest field. Having been given authority by Jesus to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness, this is what the disciples went out and did. So once again, moved with compassion, Jesus healed those who had come out to him. And then we hear in verse 15, as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Now the first thing that we need to notice in this particular exchange is this. Jesus would not have told the disciples to give the crowd something to eat if it would have been impossible for them to do this. Jesus wasn't trying to embarrass these guys. They were his disciples. They were in training to do kingdom work in the world. We need to understand that the kingdom of heaven is not limited by the realities and natural laws of the earth. The, dis the disciples' response, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, shows us that they had not as yet begun to think as kingdom citizens. In their minds, the only resources to them that they thought they had were the resources that they could see with their own eyes. 
And they could only see five loaves of bread and two small fish. But the kingdom of heaven has no such limitations. And the kingdom of heaven was at hand. The disciples were about to learn another valuable lesson. Replying to his disciples, Jesus said, Bring them to me. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Jesus gave thanks for the food, gave the bread and fish to his disciples, but the bread and the fish was made available for each person to receive as the disciples handed the food to the people who were in need of it. Miracles of multiplication took place in the Old Testament, so why not in the New? Now we know this in our heads, but we generally don't think it possible for us to be used of God in such a way. But who else does God use except ordinary people, just like us? A couple of years ago, I heard David Hogan, a missionary to Mexico, speak at a conference I was attending. He had the delightful privilege of learning about a multiplication miracle that took place after he and his ministry team had returned from ministering deep into the jungles of Mexico. He and his team had been invited to come to this particular village by a couple who had prayed for 30 years for the Holy Spirit to move mightily in their village. This couple was the only believers in the village and they suffered from much persecution because they belonged to Christ. Well, David Hogan and his ministry team carried in enough food to feed 250 people. They carried it in in igloo coolers. They had chicken and they had tortillas and they had some other items. The first miracle occurred when the food for 250 people fed 300. Now that doesn't seem like a great miracle, but when you're in a poor area and you've promised to feed the people, feeding 50 extra people is a miracle. David reports that he was the last in line, and he saw with his own eyes how he was given the last of the tortillas. After ministering among these people, David's group left. One of the missionaries on David's team received a phone call from the man who had invited them to come to the village. The man had to have walked four hours to get to a phone to make the call. When he got the missionary on the phone, the villager who had prayed his whole entire life for the fire of the Holy Spirit to fall on his village shared that he and his fellow villagers were scared. When asked why they were scared, the, the missionary was told that after David's team had left, someone had gone over to the igloo coolers, opened them up, and found them to be full of tortillas. So someone went over to the kettles where the chicken had been in, and they found it full of chicken. For three days, every time they went to the igloo or to the kettle, they found them to be full of food. They fed everybody. They fed everybody in their village. They fed everybody in neighboring villages. And they fed all of their enemies. These villagers had never experienced anything like this, and they were afraid. And what did the man want to know? Why had he called? Why had he made that four-hour trip to get to a phone call? He wanted to know how to stop the food from multiplying. David's answer to that question was, we're not. This man had prayed for 30 years for God to move in his village, and God was moving in his village. Who would want to stop that? When David Hogan's wife was told about what had happened, she said that another one of the amazing miracles that took place while God was multiplying the food was this. Out in the heat of the Mexican jungle, the food didn't spoil. God had answered the man's prayer in a mighty way, and because of it, many people in his village were being saved, and to this day, God is being glorified. Now, we may think that we could never be used in such a mighty fashion, but why couldn't we be used by God to, the, to be the instrument through whom God might show forth his mighty power of multiplication? Remember what we already learned earlier today. Unbelief limits God. 
let's believe that all things are possible for us who believe in our wonderful and in our powerful God. And this is where we are going to stop today. And let's pray and then I'll bless you. Heavenly Father, the record of the mighty deeds of God, the record of the mighty deeds Jesus did, the record of the mighty deeds the disciples did and what followers after Jesus came back to heaven to be with you are amazing. Heavenly Father, even today such things are taking place all throughout the earth. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to forgive us for our unbelief. We believe, but we still have much unbelief to overcome. Heavenly Father, we just pray that we will believe that what your word says, it says it because it's true. Heavenly Father, please mold, shape, and fashion us and, and we pray that the unbelief that we might have would be replaced with mighty, mighty faith in you. You are our God and we can trust you. You are our God and nothing limits you. You are our God and through a word you created the heavens and the earth. Heavenly Father, what is it that you cannot do? Well, nothing. Nothing is impossible for you. So we pray, Heavenly Father, that in fact uh, we might be people through whom you can work in the world. Sometimes in small ways, but sometimes in mighty ways. That's your choice, Heavenly Father, but we pray that we would in fact be people willing to be used by you in whatever way you would want to use us. Heavenly Father, you are so good. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for your living word. We thank you that you are still just as powerful today as ever. Nothing has changed for you. But we pray that we will change. We pray that our hearts will be transformed by your word, your living word, your truth. And so we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus that, in fact, we would take the truth, believe it with our whole heart, and act upon it. Again, we pray this in Jesus' name. And now, Heavenly Father, I bless all of these people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Bye-bye, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining, Pastor Kathleen. Through this message, we hope that you will have come to know God better. God can be known and wants to be known by each person on earth. God is a communicator. He has given us the Bible, his son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as means through which he reveals himself and his will to us. God is love. And regardless of what is going on in your life, God loves you and is concerned for you. He is as near as a prayer and he can be trusted to be faithful to you. Living Word is a listener-supported program. Your prayers and donations are needed to keep this program on the air. Donations can be through the Living Word website or sent to Living Word, P.O. Box, 3810, Alice, Texas, 78333-3810. If you have a question you'd like to ask Pastor Kathleen, a comment you'd like to share, or would like to purchase a CD of this message, and have access to the Internet, Pastor Kathleen's website is www.livingwordradio.org. If you are in the area and would like to join Pastor Kathleen and the congregation she serves on the weekend, she is pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Alice, Texas.